Our guest today is Tom Ball, Senior Vice President of Alliance Advisors. He's based up near New York City. He's been in the proxy solicitation business forever. I've known him a long time. He's a great guy. I'm Brock Romanek, today on Zippy Point. So Tom, proxy plumbing, you and I have been around long enough to remember when that term didn't exist. It's actually pretty recent uh, when the SEC started looking at perhaps reforming the process. So they someone someone coined the term proxy plumbing, but I don't remember hearing that before, I don't know, 2008 or so. Um, but it is a real thing. It is a, such a complicated system. So thank you so much for joining us. And, yeah, and glad to be here. Us through this stuff. So what's the difference between book entry and certificated form of ownership? Well, first of all, we're talking about shareholders who own their stock directly with the company as opposed to owning it through a bank or a broker. Um, so these shareholders are, I refer to them as record holders or registered shareholders, uh, and they can hold their shares in one of two ways with the company, either directly um, as in certificated or through book entry. Um, and I think you need to think of this in, in terms of money. Um, you can either have your money in actual bills like this, um, or you can have your money in a bank and get a bank statement that shows you what you have. So if you're a cer certificated holder, you have physical stock certificates like you have physical money. Uh, if you're book entry, you hold the shares with the company and they send you a statement reflecting your ownership. And these days, almost everything is in book entry. I mean, those Absolutely. old stock certificates, the railroad companies from 100 years ago now go for a pretty penny and they're gorgeous. They're, in, they're these engraved pieces of art, really. Um, but I haven't seen a stock certificate be issued personally to, to me. And actually, I almost think my whole, my whole life, I don't know if I've ever had a stock certificate. Well, actually, actually, we did some work with the Green Bay Packers when they went public and everybody bought one share so they could put it on the wall. Yeah, get that funny. Otherwise, it's all book entry. Yeah. So what's the difference between record holders and beneficial owners? So, so record holders, we just discussed, those are the shareholders that own the stock with the company. Um, if you're a beneficial owner, you bought your shares through Merrill Lynch or Goldman Sachs or a bank. So the broker or bank actually has custody of the shares. You're the owner, but the bank has custody. That's a beneficial owner. Um, and, and by the way, you know, 80% of most companies' outstanding shares are held by beneficial owners. Yeah, and that's a big difference from the last over, over the last few decades. It's definitely Absolutely. gradually moved towards beneficial ownership to the point where now it's you know a super majority of a company's ownership. And then sometimes I get confused between the difference between record holders and beneficial owners, and then the difference between obos and nobos. Obos meaning objecting beneficial owners, and nobos meaning non-objecting beneficial owners. Right. What's, what's the difference between obos and nobos? So if, so if you're a beneficial owner and you hold your shares through a broker or bank, um, a company can send a request to the broker and say, give us a list of the underlying beneficial owners, name, address, share amount. Um, if you don't want your information released, you can object to that uh, and the company won't receive your information. Uh, and therefore you're a objecting beneficial owner because you objected to your name being released. On the other hand, if you haven't objected and the company makes a legitimate request, the broker will give them your name, address, and share amount, and you're a non-objecting beneficial owner because you didn't object. Uh, and by the way, most, uh, most beneficial owners are non-objecting beneficial owners because basically they don't understand the system. So they become non-objecting. Yeah, it really depends on your broker and what their default is because when you go and open a brokerage account, let's say you go down to Schwab and you open an account, if the default is a no-bo, you're probably going to sign it and not make the switch because, again, people don't care whether the companies see them as owners on their books, if I'm understanding this correctly. That, that's correct. And also keep in mind that the brokers get some money every time a no-bo list is ordered. So it's in their beneficial best interest to have you be a non-objecting beneficial owner. All right, so you just mentioned a, a no-bo list. What, what is a, what is a no-bo list? So a no-bo list is, it's, again, those who haven't objected. You make a request as the company, the broker, and actually they work through Broadridge. Um, Broadridge will issue a list that shows each holder, 
number of shares and their address. It doesn't tell you what broker or bank they hold through. It's just, you can see that Tom Ball owns 100 shares and here, here's his address. And, uh, you know, typically on a noble list, it's almost all individuals. Yeah, and I have a separate big guide explaining uh, who Broadridge is, but basically the nutshell is they have a contract with most of the brokers and the banks on the street to act as their agent. And so there's sort of the intermediary, intermediary between beneficial owners and the brokers and banks. Broadridge is basically the subcontractor from the brokers right. and banks to perform a bunch of obligations and duties that, that they have. Um, because Broadridge has the, the machinery, literally the machinery uh, out in Long Island to do that. That's right. So as I understand it during the proxy season ahead of the annual shareholders meeting that companies want to obtain a no-bill list maybe more than once um, from Broadridge, right? It's from Correct. Broadridge so that uh -huh. they can see who the shareholders are and and how they're voting. So when, you know, did I... <laughs> What I said, is that true? And then when would that happen? When would companies uh, ask for a no bill list? And do they ask for it more than once? Well, if you're going to ask for no, first of all, a no bill list can get expensive for a large company. Um, and if you're going to order one, you'd order one as of the record date for the upcoming shareholder meeting. Um, and in my experience, you don't always order one. Uh, you order it if you've got a contentious issue on the agenda and you want to be able to reach out by phone or mail directly to the Novos, you would order it. Um, so for the most part, if it's a routine meeting, you don't order it. But you also, you should be aware that you can order a, a, a list that's not a full list. You can ask for a list of a holders, Novos a thousand and over, let's say. So instead of spending the money for the names of 10,000 people, maybe you get the names of 200 people, but that gives you an idea of who your largest holders are. Um, and if your solicitation firm is doing an ID project for you, that's really helpful in identifying holders. But, but again, keep in mind, most of those holders are going to be individuals, the uh, institutions, the hedge funds, the activists, um, they want confidentiality. So they'll be OBOs. They won't be on those lists. So what typically will be on a, on, on a NOBO list? Was, I assume it's a, a PDF when it's ordered. And what would the sort of things be on in the various columns? Well, again, it's going to be name, address, share amount. It comes electronically. Um, it's a cumbersome process, but you end up getting a, a, a disk from Broadridge. You download it, drop it into Excel, and you can play with it any way you want. Uh, so a PDF isn't going to do you a lot of good, but the, uh, once it's in Excel, you can do your analysis compared to other lists that you've had in the past. All right, so we started with the easy stuff. Now let's walk through the quagmire. And that wasn't even that easy. What is DTC? What is CD and company? And why does that matter? How do they play a role in, in this, the layers, the chain of ownership? Yeah, so it, this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but it's important. So um, <clears throat> DTC stands for the Depository Trust Company. They were started back, I believe, in 1973. And they were started to um, help provide a system whereby brokers and banks didn't have to exchange certificates uh, when trades happened. Um, so DTC was set up to provide clearing and settlement all electronically, all book entry. Um, and how that works is instead of uh, each bank and broker having shares of XYZ company in their vault, um, they deposit it with the depository trust company, therefore the name depository, right? So, uh, for example, if a shareholder owning shares of XYZ company at Goldman Sachs sells 100,000 shares and somebody at TD Ameritrade buys those shares, at, in the DTC system, Goldman is debited, TD is credited. So you don't have some person taking a physical certificate, walking up Wall Street from Goldman to TD and handing it over, which literally used to happen. So this is all electronic um, and is immobilizing the certificates. Um, <clears throat> CD and Co is a nominee of Depository Trust Company. Um, and what, what that means is if you look on most companies' shareholder lists and look in descending order, the largest holder is gonna be CD and Co. And CD and Co, again, a nominee of DTC, 
uh, represents the shares held by the underlying banks and brokers. So, you know, for most companies, 70, 80% of their shares are held at DTC in the name of CD and Co. Uh, so in terms of ownership, you've got CD and Co or DTC, synonymous in some ways. Underneath that, you have banks and brokers and below that are the actual owners, the beneficial owners who vote the shares. Um, so that, that's how that system works. And from the company's perspective, as I understand it, if you have, and these parties are all OBOs, objecting beneficial owners, if they're making these trades and it's just book entries in the DTC system, as a company, I'm not gonna know that my shareholder base has just changed, that the shares got transferred from one OBO to another. Is, is that right? Well, actually, you would know it. I mean, if, um, you know, if your proxy solicitation firm is doing a stock watch program for you, monitoring the trading, they're going to get da daily lists from DTC, and they'll see the movements between Goldman and TD and other intermediaries. Um, and knowing who the custodians hold on behalf of, which institutions, you could kind of figure out, you know, which institution just sold and who bought the shares. So if you're doing a monitoring program, you get those lists every single day. Right. And that, but that's if you hire a solicitor that has a stock Correct. watch program. Correct. Like Correct. Otherwise, the company's not going to know. All they know is that the DTC still has 10 million shares on the books. They don't yeah. see the movement underneath. So what about the omnibus proxy? That, what is that and, and why should you get that from DTC before each shareholder's meeting? So the, the omnibus proxy is, it, it really comes in two parts. One is the list of the underlying banks and brokers. So a company can request from DTC an omnibus proxy. What they'll receive would be a list of the underlying banks and brokers, but more importantly, or as important, is an omnibus proxy, which reassigns the voting rights from DTC or CD and Co to the underlying banks and brokers. And, and why that's important is, first of all, DTC doesn't want anything to do with mailing out proxy material and voting. So they reassign the voting rights to the banks and brokers. It is then the bank and broker that's responsible for mailing out material and getting the votes back. Um, so so that's, that's an important thing. It's a tool that the company needs so that when shares get voted, again, because CD Co is the registered holder, they can tie it back to the registered holder, which is CD Co. So if a vote comes in from Goldman Sachs, the omnibus proxy is reassigned the voting rights to Goldman, so Goldman has the right to vote those shares. And then in turn, Goldman will hire, you know, hires Broadridge to actually send out that's correct. The, vo the voting instruction forms, which are akin basically to proxy cards, but the, the, the VIFs are what goes to beneficial owners. And I do have a separate vid guide about the difference between a, a voting instruction form, a proxy card, an annual meeting ballot, and actually the notice of internet availability. <laughs> More stuff that's complicated in this proxy plumbing area. So let's talk about broker search cards. What are these search cards? Who sends those out and, and when? So if, if a company's having an annual meeting, they, uh, they're required under SEC Rule 14A13 to inquire of banks and brokers, do you own shares in XYZ company? And if so, on behalf of how many underlying beneficial owners? That way the company knows that, let's use Goldman again, that Goldman has 2,000 holders of XYZ company, and they know to send 2,000 copies of the proxy and you know, other relevant materials to Goldman. Of course, that's all done through Broadridge, but the search starts the process of uncovering who owns the shares, how many holders there are, which brokers. Um, and that notice, when it's sent out, we refer to it as a broker search, whether it's electronic or, or physical, it's a broker search, and the notice itself, the piece of paper would be the search card. Uh, and, and by the way, the SEC requires you to send that notice out that the issuer send the notice out at least 20 business days prior to the record date. So that's a pretty big chunk of time before the record date. That's right. mm -hmm. a month. Yeah, and, and, and you know, this is, um, with everything being electronic these days, you don't need that much time. This goes back many, many, many years when it did take that long for brokers to get their records together. So it's a, it's a, it's a little dated, but it's, it's the rule. So I have this question way down on the list here in our agenda, and we've already mentioned Broadridge before, but it's good to repeat it because this area can be also confusing. So how does Broadridge fit into all this with, with beneficial owners? If you well, you know, I, I, 
I think think of Broadridge as kind of a clearinghouse um, for brokers and banks. Uh, rather than in the past years ago, each bank and broker had their own proxy department, and the proxy material would go to the proxy department. They would mail it out. They would tabulate the votes. Um, the brokers weren't making any money having an in-house proxy department, so Broadridge was was brought into existence. Um, originally ADP, now they're Broadridge. And they basically contract with the brokers and banks. The brokers and banks send their information about the underlying beneficial owners. Broadridge consolidates that information. They do the mailing, they do the tabulation. The broker and the bank are out of the process once they've turned over the uh, list of shareholders. Um, and for most companies, that means that 95% of your proxy material that's going to street name or beneficial owners is going to go to Broadridge's warehouse and they'll take care of distribution. Uh, you also have Mediant and other providers, but Broadridge is the uh, 800 pound gorilla here. Yeah, with notice and access, you know, a lot of the mailings are going electronic, but there's yep. still a lot of physical mailing. And I, I've been to Long Island, their plan out there, and it's, it's huge. You know, it's an incredible thing to see. And that's why the barrier to entry to have a, a big competitor would be hard because of the physical expenditures that would, you know, the amount of money you would have to sink in exactly, just to get exactly. operation off the ground. Yeah. And they've been doing it forever. And then uh, on the record holder side, what do the transfer agents do? And then I know Broadridge also sometimes, Broadridge also is a transfer agent in, over the last, I don't know, five, 10 years. Um, so they do some of this record holder activity as well as the activity they do with the beneficial owners. But there's also many other transfer agents, even though that industry has been consolidating. Uh, it used to be hundreds, and now it's yeah. probably down to 100 or so transfer agents, but you, you know better than me. But anyways, what, what, what's the relationship with the transfer agents and the record holders? And So, you know, you know kind of in a traditional situation, the transfer agent's going to handle the mailing to those registered or record holders, the uh, individuals holding directly with the company, either certificated or book entry. Uh, and again, that's a, a shrinking piece of the pie every year uh, because so many people are going to street name. Um, but if you have record holders, somebody has to mail to them. You can contract out to Broadridge to do it, or you can have your transfer agent do it. And the transfer agent maintains the list of the individual shareholders. So they're in a position to do the mailing and the tabulation. So Tom, I don't know if someone was to be joining the proxy solicitation industry, how many years does it take to get up to speed to really get to know everything? <laughs> uh, training must take a long time. It takes a long time. It's a you know it's a Byzantine process. There are a lot of players involved, um, and it doesn't work perfectly. But you know it's kind of like a utility in some way. The proxy industry it's a lot of moving pieces. But when you get home and you turn the light on, um, you you want it to work, um, and the proxy system works even with all these various players and, and whatnot. Uh, so, uh, and it gets more complicated globally because every country sort of has their own. Oh, system. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And it's more of a global marketplace. Yeah. So thanks very much. You're welcome.